I'd like to first of all talk about the causes of the present crisis, uh, and I'd like to speculate on where this is all headed. Now, with regard to the causes, it's very important to understand that who caused this situation is of tremendous importance because it involves assigning blame. Uh, you really have two choices here. You can argue that the West and especially the United States caused the crisis, uh, or you can argue that the Russians caused the crisis. But that means that whoever you argue caused the crisis is responsible for this disaster. And it is important to understand that this is a disaster. Uh, Ukraine has lost Crimea. Uh, it's, in my opinion, going to lose the Donbass. Uh, and the only interesting question to me at this point is whether it's also going to lose more territory uh, in the eastern part of its country. Uh, furthermore, uh, Ukraine's economy is wrecked. Uh, its cities are in the process of being wrecked. Uh, the international economy is going to be badly affected by these events as they go on. Uh, this is going to have terrible consequences, I think, for the Democrats in the fall. Furthermore, it makes it difficult for the United States to pivot out of uh, Europe and pivot to China, where there is a potential threat, which is China. Uh, furthermore, we're driving the Russians into the arms of the Chinese, which makes no sense at all. And all at the same time, we're making Eastern Europe a very unstable region uh, and therefore forcing us to, if anything, up the ante there. Uh, so this is a disastrous situation. So the question of who caused it and who bears the blame really matters. Now, the conventional wisdom in the United States and in the West more generally uh, is that the Russians are responsible for this. And in particular, Vladimir Putin is responsible. Um, as I'm sure almost all of you know, I don't buy this argument at all, and I haven't bought it for a long time. In my opinion, the West bears primarily, primary responsibility uh, for what is happening today. And it was largely a result of a decision uh, in April 2006 to make Ukraine and to make Georgia uh, a part of NATO. We were going to integrate uh, Ukraine into NATO come hell or high water. Now, the Russians said at the time that this is categorically unacceptable. Uh, the Russians made it clear that they had swallowed the first two tranches of NATO expansion, the 99 expansion and the 2004 expansion, but Georgia and Ukraine were not going to become part of NATO. Uh, they were drawing a line in the sand. They said, this is an existential threat to us. And indeed, in August of that year, of course, August 2008, you had a war involving the Russians and the Georgians over the whole issue of whether or not Georgia would become part of NATO. Uh, now, it's important to understand that when we talk about Western policy and we focus on NATO and expansion of NATO into Ukraine, that actually Western policy had three prongs to it. Uh, the core prong was definitely integrating Ukraine into NATO, but the other two prongs were integrating Ukraine into the European Union and turning Ukraine into a pro-Western liberal democracy, in, in effect, uh, putting in place the Orange Revolution. Uh, and these three prongs of the strategy were all designed to make Ukraine a pro-Western country, a country in the West orbit sitting on Russia's border. And again, the Russians made it unequivocally clear at the time um, that this was not going to happen. Now, the first crisis broke out in February 2014. The way I like to think about this is that you had a major crisis in February 2014, broke out that date. Then you had a major crisis breaking out in December of last year, that's December 2021. And on February 24th of this year, the war started. Now, what about this crisis in February of 2014, February 22nd to be exact. 
It was precipitated in large part by uh, a coup that was supported by the United States that took place in Ukraine and resulted in a pro-Russian leader, President Yanukovych, being overthrown and being replaced by a pro-American prime minister. Uh, the Russians found this intolerable. Uh, at the same time, they were debating um, with the West and with the Ukrainians over EU expansion. And always in the background at that point in time was NATO expansion. Uh, this blew up and uh, it had two consequences. One is that the Russians, in effect, took Crimea away from Ukraine for themselves. They had no intention of ever letting Sevastopol become a NATO NATO. And the second thing that happened is that the Russians helped foster a civil war in eastern Ukraine. And of course, that civil war festered well after 2014. But the crisis really blew up in 2014. Then, starting about mid-year, and really heating up at the end of last year, I would say in December 2021, was a second major crisis. And the question is, what caused this crisis? And in my opinion, it was caused largely by the fact that Ukraine was becoming a de facto member of NATO. It's commonplace in the West, especially in Washington these days, to say that Russia had nothing to fear regarding Ukraine becoming part of NATO. And Russia had nothing to fear because NATO was doing nothing to move forward Ukraine's incorporation into NATO. I think in a de jure sense, that's absolutely correct. But in a de facto way, that's wrong. What we were doing was we were arming the Ukrainians. And you want to remember, it's President Trump in December of 2017, who, who was under great pressure, who decided to arm the Ukrainians. So we were arming the Ukrainians, uh, we were training the Ukrainians, and we were forming ever closer diplomatic ties with the Ukrainians. And this spooked the Russians. It especially spooked the Russians in the summer of last year when the Ukrainian military used drones against Russian forces in the Donbass region. It especially spooked the Russians last summer when the British drove a destroyer through territorial waters, Russian territorial waters in the Black Sea. It especially spooked the Russians in November uh, when we were flying bombers within 13 miles of the Russian coast. So all these events coupled with this de facto, uh, de facto uh, bringing of Ukraine into NATO pushed the Russians to what Sergei Lavrov said was the boiling point. You know Lavrov was asked in January why the Russians uh, had reached this point. Uh, and why we were in the midst of a crisis. And he said, Lavrov said in January, we had reached our boiling point. First expansion of NATO, second expansion of NATO, and then all of these events associated with Ukraine. The Russians had had it. So you had a crisis of massive proportions, which of course resulted on February 24th in the uh, uh, Russians invading Ukraine. And we are now in the midst of a real war. This is not just a civil war in Eastern Ukraine, which is what we had before February 24th. Uh, we now have a real war. So this brings us to the question of what is the conventional wisdom on this subject? And how do I think about the opposing argument? The opposing argument is that this has nothing to do with NATO expansion. It's really quite remarkable. When, when you listen to people in the administration speak, uh, and when you read uh, editorials in, in the Washington Post, uh, words like this are spoken. This has absolutely nothing to do with NATO expansion. I, I don't know how anybody can say that. The Russians have been saying since April, 2008, that this is all about NATO expansion, that NATO expansion into Ukraine is an existential threat to them. But Americans simply refuse to believe that. Not all Americans, but 
many Americans, and certainly the policy elite in this country. And instead, what they have done is they've created a story that it is not American policy. It's not NATO expansion that's driving this train. Instead, it's Vladimir Putin. And it's the fact that Vladimir Putin is either bent on recreating the Soviet Union, or he's interested in creating a greater Russia. But whichever one of those two outcomes you take, he is ultimately an expansionist. He's on the march. And thank God we expanded NATO, because if we hadn't expanded NATO, he'd probably be in Berlin by now, if not Paris. This is the basic argument. Uh, he is an aggressor. There are a number of problems with that argument. First of all, before February 22nd, 2014, nobody was arguing that he was aggressor. Nobody was arguing that NATO expansion was required for the purposes of containing Russia before February 22nd, 2014. Uh, we didn't think he was a problem. And in fact, when the crisis broke out on February 22nd, 2014, we were actually shocked. If you go back and look at the newspapers at the time, the Obama administration was caught with its pants down. Why? Because they didn't think that the Ukraine, uh, excuse me, that the Russians were aggressive. But of course, we had to invent the story after the crisis broke out so that we weren't blamed for what happened. We had to blame the Russians. So we created the story. Second reason you want to doubt this is that Putin has never said that he is bent on recreating uh, the Soviet Union or he's bent on creating a greater Russia. He's never said he was bent on conquering Ukraine and integrating it into Russia. There's no question that in his heart, he thinks that uh, uh, it would be appropriate for Ukraine to be part of Russia. In his heart, he's made it clear he'd love back to bring back the Soviet Union. But he's also explicitly said that in his head, he fully understands that this is a bad idea. So if you look at what he said, there's no reason to think he's bent on recreating the Soviet Union or creating a greater Russia. To take this a step further, he doesn't have the capability. He doesn't have the capability for two reasons. First of all, he doesn't have a big enough military. This is a country whose gross national product is smaller than Texas's, right? This is not the former Soviet Union in its heyday. Furthermore, the Russians understand that occupying, country in, uh, occupying countries or occupying territory in Eastern Europe is a prescription for big trouble. Most of us on this call are old enough to remember the Cold War and all the trouble that the Soviets had. Think East Germany, 1953, Hungary, 1956, Czechoslovakia in 1968, constant trouble with the Poles. And one could argue that the Romanians and the Albanians were the biggest pain in the necks they ever faced. The Russians are surely sophisticated enough to know that not only do they not have the capability, but that occupying Ukraine, occupying the Baltic states would be like swallowing a porcupine. This would be crazy. So I think there's hardly any evidence to support that. And the final point I'd make is if you look at what the Russians are doing militarily in Ukraine at the moment, it does not look like they're bent on conquering the country and occupying it and integrating it into a greater Russia. But anyway, here we are. And I think everybody is very interested in the question of where we go from here. So let me say a few words about that. First of all, let me start with US policy. US policy is to double down. That's what we're going to do. This is what we did after 2014. Instead of reevaluating and saying maybe NATO expansion is not such a good idea, we went in the opposite direction. This is why I'm telling you that by 2021, the Russians understood that we were turning Ukraine into a de facto member of NATO. They understood that. Uh, so what we did after 2014 is double down. And what we're going to do now and what we're doing now is doubling down. And what does that mean? We're encouraging the Ukrainians to resist. 
we're not going to fight for them. You understand? We're going to fight to the last Ukrainian, but we're not going to do any of the fighting. They're on their own in that regard. But we're going to arm them and do what we can to train them at this late date and hope that they can hang in there uh, and uh, and duke it out with the Russians. And nobody believes they're going to defeat the Russians, but maybe you'll get a stalemate. Now, the question you have to ask yourself, this is really the key question, is what are the Russians going to do, right? Uh, it seems to me that a lot of people in the West think that uh, if the Ukrainians provide enough resistance, the Russians will roll over and play dead. Uh, or maybe Vladimir Putin will throw his hands up, he'll surrender, he'll say, this was all a bad idea, uh, I regret doing it. Uh, or maybe there'll be a coup in Moscow, he'll be overthrown, and they'll bring in leaders who will work out a deal with us, and Ukraine will live happily ever after, we will live happily ever after, and the Russians will be chastened. I've spent my entire adult life studying great power politics. I know a lot about great power politics. This is not the way the world works, and it is certainly not the way the Russians work. You want to understand, going back to what I said about the April 2008 decision, the Russians said at the time, this is an existential threat. This is an existential threat, right? So even before the current war, Ukraine, and Ukraine becoming part of NATO was viewed as an existential threat. Now you're talking about a situation where you defeat the Russians in Ukraine. This is a much worse outcome for the Russians than what happened in April 2008, and a much worse outcome than what happened in February 2014. And the Russians are not going to roll over and play dead. In fact, what the Russians are going to do is they're going to crush the Ukrainians. They're going to bring out the big guns. They're going to turn places like Kiev and other cities in Ukraine into rubble. They're going to do Fallujahs. They're going to do Mosuls. They're going to do Groznys. You know what happened in World War II when the United States was faced with the possibility of having to invade the Japanese home islands in early 1945. The idea of invading the Japanese home islands after what happened at Iwo Jima and then later what happened in Okinawa really spooked us. So you know what we did? We decided to burn Japanese cities to the ground starting on March 10th, 1945. We killed more people the first night we firebombed Tokyo than we killed at either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. And we were systematically burning Japanese cities to the ground. Why? Because we did not want to invade the Japanese main islands. When a great power feels threatened, when it... the Russians are going to pull out all stops in Ukraine to make sure that they win. And then there's the nuclear dimension to this. The Russians have already put their nuclear weapons on high alert. This is a really significant development because what they were doing was sending us a very powerful signal as to how seriously they take this crisis and what's going on. So again, if we start winning and the Russians start losing, you want to understand that what we're talking about doing here is backing a nuclear armed great power that sees what's happening as an existential threat into a corner. This is really dangerous. Go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't think that what happened in the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis was as threatening to us as this situation is to the Russians. But if you go back and look at how American decision makers thought at the time, they were scared stiff. They thought that Soviet missiles in Cuba was an existential threat, and they were willing, many of Kennedy's advisors, to use our nuclear arsenal against the Soviet Union. That's how serious great powers get when they think they face existential threats. So in my opinion, we are in a very dangerous situation. I think the likelihood of nuclear war is very small, but the likelihood doesn't have to be high for me to be really scared because of the consequences associated with nuclear use. So we better be extremely careful here regarding what we do in terms of pushing the Russians into the corner. But again, 
I'm not sure that's going to happen because I think what's going to happen here is that in a competition between us and the Russians, the Russians will win. Now you're saying to yourself, why is he saying that? I think that if you uh, think about this, you want to think about who has the greater resolve, right? Who, who really cares more about this situation, the Russians or the Americans? The Americans do not care that much about Ukraine. The Americans have made it clear they are not even willing to fight and die for Ukraine. So it's not that important to us. For the Russians, they have made it clear it's an existential threat. So the balance of resolve, I believe, favors them. So as we walk up the escalation ladder moving forward, my guess, and it's just my guess, is that the Russians will prevail, not the Americans, and the Russians will prevail because the balance of resolve favors them. Now, the question is, who loses this war? Uh, I think it doesn't matter much to the United States if we lose in the sense that the Russians prevail in Ukraine. I think the real losers in this war are the Ukrainians. And I think what's happened here is we have led the Ukrainians down the primrose path. We have pushed very hard to encourage the Ukrainians to want to become part of NATO. We have pushed very hard to make them part of NATO. We have pushed very hard to make them a Western bulwark on Russia's borders, despite the fact the Russians made it clear that this was unacceptable to them. We, in effect, and here I'm talking about the West, we took a stick and we poked the bear in the eye. And as you all know, if you take a stick and you poke a bear in the eye, that bear is probably not going to smile and laugh at what you're doing. That bear is probably going to fight back. And that's exactly what's happening here. And that bear is going to tear apart Ukraine. That bear is in the process of tearing apart Ukraine. And again, we go back to where we started. Who bears responsibility for this? Do the Russians bear responsibility for this? I don't think so. There's no question the Russians are doing the dirty work. I don't want to make light of that fact. But the question is, what caused the Russians to do this? And in my opinion, the answer is very simple. The United States of America. Thank you. John, I thank you for setting the stage so well and giving us the context. Um, I uh, particularly like uh, the label that has been given to you as an offensive realist. Well, that sure comes through clear tonight, doesn't it? The U.S. is to blame? <laughs> How offensive is that? <laughs> I'm going to give a thumbnail description of how I come at this. Uh, John and I both uh, grew up in the streets of New York, uh, John in Brooklyn and I in the Bronx. Actually, my wife's from Brooklyn. She married up, as we used to say in, the, in those days. In any case, uh, I remember being at the hands of bigger gangs and bigger guys. And I used to shake my fist when I got home and say, when I get big, I'm never going to let anybody do that to me. Okay. Well, here's the analogy. Putin just got big. He got big last year. He got big when the Chinese threw their lot in with him and said, yeah, we're in the same fix you are. Let's join hands. Let's join forces and do the kind of alliance that exceeds the traditional alliance. That's kind of my bottom line here. But let me get a little bit involved in Ukraine first. Uh, how many, if I can see a show of hands, how many have seen the video of, uh, of Victoria Nuland and our ambassador in Kiev, uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, uh, talking about how they were going to arrange this coup in Kiev? Well, Okay, and not too many. So let me let me see if we can bring that one up now. Um, is is that the video queued up? The one with Newland uh, talking to Pyatt? What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here. 
um, especially the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now. So we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think what, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I, I, kinda... I, I, just, I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yats and Yuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? My understanding from that call, but you tell me, was that the big three were going into their own meeting and that Yats was going to offer in that context a, a three-way, you know, the three-plus-one conversation or three-plus-two with you. Is that not how you understood it? No, I think, I mean, that's what he proposed, but I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them where um, – Klitschko has been the top dog. He's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got, and he's probably talking to his guys at this point. So I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three, and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind it, behind it before they all sit down and he, um, he explains why he doesn't like it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he wants to talk before or after? Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay, I've now written, oh, one more wrinkle for you, Jeff. Yeah. I uh, can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the U.N. guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the U.N. help glue it. And, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together because you can be pretty sure that if it does, if it does start to gain altitude, the Russians will be working behind the scenes to try to torpedo it. And, again, the fact that this is out there right now, I'm still trying to figure out in my mind why Yanukovych that. But in the meantime, there's a party of regions faction meeting going on right now, and I'm sure there's a lively argument going on in that group at this point. But uh, anyway, we could uh, we could land jelly side up on this one if we move fast. So let me work on let me work on Klitschko, and if you can just keep, I, I think we want to try to get somebody with an international personality to um, come out here and help to midwife this thing. And then the other the other issue is some kind of outreach to Yanukovych, but we probably regroup on that tomorrow as we see how things start to fall into place. So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Okay. This coup was the most blatant coup in history. It was advertised 18 days beforehand on YouTube. <laughs> When a conversation, an intercepted conversation between Assistant Secretary of State Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt was put on YouTube on the 4th, on the 4th of February, 2014. Now McGovern, being used to a little bit, a little bit used to coups and what happens if they're divulged ahead of time, breathed a sigh of relief and said, oh, poor yachts, poor yachts in your <laughs> He's never going to be prime minister now. The, the, the coup's blown. Well, apparently, Vladimir Putin had the same reaction because he stayed in Sochi for the Winter Olympics, never decided to come home. And lo and behold, on the 22nd of February, 
There's the coup. Now, we know enough about the coup now to know that it was arranged uh, by, with thanks to the Western intelligence services, if you could put it that way, and uh, we know the result. Now, for just a little bit of background, why did Victoria Newland, uh, who, whose claim to fame is working for Dick Cheney and who is an arch neocon person, why did she decide it was so important to get the Russians, to get them over the barrel in, in Ukraine? Well, um, it goes back to the year before. The year before when, uh, if we could have the, the, the second slide, when I say slide, the year before when President Obama, to his credit, was reluctant to start another war in the Middle East. They wanted him to bomb Syria. He didn't want to bomb Syria. He even said, you know, I'll go to Congress. Oh, that's a big deal. Okay. Now, here was a New York Times op-ed after Putin pulled Obama's chestnuts out of the fire. I hope that you can see it. It appeared on September 11th, 2014. In the midst of all this, this appeared in the New York Times, and it said that my working and personal relationship with Obama is marked by growing trust. Trust, the coin of the realm. Then he objected to something. Then he said, you know, uh, his speech, uh, that Obama's speech last week really bothered me. I don't agree with it at all. This business is about the exceptional country, being able to do exceptional things. No, no. The way I look at it, there are big countries and small countries, rich and poor, uh, one with long traditions of democracy, others different, their policies different. Well, we're all different. But when the Lord's blessings look, look on us, we must not forget that God created us all equal. Now, I was told at the time by a pretty good source that Putin penned that last paragraph of that op-ed himself. And confirmation of a kind came about two years ago when he gave an interview and uh, sort of off the top of his head, he said precisely the same thing in almost exactly the same words. So what does that mean? Growing trust? What does that do to the Mickey Mat? What does that do to the military, industrial, congressional, intelligence, media, academia, think tank, complex, which grew like topsy after Eisenhower's warning that uh, unbridled influence of, these, uh, of this MIC, the military industrial complex, would be a danger to our democracy. Uh, a little footnote there, Eisenhower said the only antidote to that is a fully informed American citizenry. And we have that far from that now. What's my point here? Uh, this was the high water of our relationship, September 2013. It took the neocons, not even a year, about a half a year, to stage the coup on the Maidan in Kiev. Uh, the, the causal relationship was not something that McGovern dreamed up. Bob Perry and I went through this in detail, and it seemed, uh, and actually I had a, uh, I had a Katberg seat, at the, at the top of the CNN building, when Joe Lieberman and Paul Wolfowitz were talking about this as though, well, it, it looked like a funeral there. They had missed their chance. They didn't get their war against Syria. And so a lot of this was reaction to that. They had a lot of time to prepare and they invested five billion, billion with a B, dollars into Ukraine's aspirations to join the West, okay? So here we had a decent chance for growing trust, okay? Doverai no proverai, trust but verify. Um, this was all shunted aside by the coup arranged primarily by Newland and uh, Pyatt and the other people who were doing the dirty work and acquiesced in by our French and our German allies. They were there. They saw what happened. Steinmeier, uh, the German foreign minister, 
I met with his principal deputy and I started talking about the coup in Kiev. And he said, get this. He said, what coup? He was there, Steinmeier. And the French took it upon themselves to guarantee the Minsk process. And they didn't have the chance. They didn't have the guts to follow through because the U.S. didn't want it. So maybe I'm an offensive realist, but that's how I look at it. Could we have the next slide, please? Okay, now, uh, just at about this time, uh, you will uh, be surprised, perhaps. No, no, it's the one before that. Yeah. Now, the Defense Intelligence Agency is obliged by act of Congress to make sure they do a, a, an annual strategy report. And this is what they came up with at the end of 2015. So they had a year, a year plus since the coup. Now, that's what they said. That's what the Kremlin is convinced the U.S. is trying to do. Uh, John Mearsheimer is very nice in calling that uh, democracy promotion. <laughs> but, but he explains that in the next phrase by saying, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a coup. So this is what the Defense Intelligence Agency said. Who knows that they issued this? Did McGovern get this from Jonathan Pollard or one of his old successors? No, no, you have to read. You have to read everything that comes out in the media. This slipped out. May we have the next slide, please? Okay, what I'd like to do is get a little granular here and talk about uh, how we proceeded once, uh, once Biden got his feet, so to speak, feet on the ground. I call this uh, US diplomacy. Uh, you can think of it what you will. March 17th, Putin's a killer. March 18th, 19th, Blinken and Sullivan insult the Chinese talking down to them and making very much like the old imperialists that the Chinese are so, so used to. Now, interestingly, on March 24th, this is all last year, the Ukrainian President Zelensky, uh, out of the blue announced, we're taking back Crimea. We're taking back Crimea. And uh, if we have to use military means, well, so be it. That's what we'll do. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't think there's anybody, not even on CNN, who would say that Zelensky thought of this idea all by himself and, and didn't check with the United States. Of course, he got permission. So put yourself in Putin's place. It's pretty much a declaration of war and was described as such by Western media as well. Aha, what's Putin going to do now? It's Ukrainian official policy. It's, a, it's an order that we're going to take back Crimea. This is important, okay? Because it's all in this calculation that, that uh, Putin is looking at these new leaders, leaders, if you will, and seeing what they're doing, how they're acting, killer, talking to the Chinese. Now we're gonna take back Crimea. Now on March 25th, <laughs> no coincidence, 24th, 25th, Russian troops start going around the area of Ukraine. Now they built up a lot of troops. And of course we reported that and the New York Times, Washington Post reported that ad nauseum. But finally, uh, Biden got wind of it, or at least started to appreciate the significance of it. And he calls, he calls Putin on April 13th. Now, what else happened on April 13th? Well, everybody was saying, oh, there are tons and tons of troops there. There are a lot of troops. And Shoigu, the defense minister, gets up and says, yeah, you got that right. Um, would you believe two armies? and three airborne, airborne units, would you believe that? That's what we mean by um, disquilibrium. This is what we mean by asymmetrical power. You got it? Biden on that same day reverses the Navy's orders, sending two 
uh, heavily armed and very sophisticated ships into the Black Sea. If you're about to enter the Dardanelles and he turned them around, said, like, go visit Greece. And then finally, on that same day, Biden suggests, hey, Vladimir, let's have a summit. We'd like to get together and talk this stuff through because we don't like this, okay? Next slide, please. So the summit takes place uh, on the 16th of June, okay? And Biden says to Putin, and we know this from Biden's own voice, okay? What Biden is saying is they couldn't get him onto the plane long enough to have him say these strange things, okay? Uh, Biden to Putin, we know you got a rough road to hoe here. We know you're being squeezed by the Chinese. We know <laughs> they're multi-thousand mile border. Uh, Chinese is not only going to be a major economic power, it's going to be a major military. We, we, we know about that. You know, I would love to have been a fly on the wall when Putin uh, connected with his advisors and said, who's advising this president? Uh, who's telling him that the situation is the same between China and Russia as it was four decades ago? <laughs> I mean, hello. And so they decided, Putin and Z finally, we gotta educate this guy. <laughs> we gotta tell him that nobody's squeezing anyone else except in the fraternal embrace. And that's what they set out to do for the next several months. On December 15th, 2021, uh, there was a summit, a virtual summit between Putin and Z, uh, President Xi, President Xi Jinping of, of China. Now, uh, it was heavily choreographed and they, they gave the first minute to the New York Times and other media uh, because it was, it was so clearly designed to show, look, we are very close allies. As a matter of fact, they made the claim that our relationship, our strategic relationship, exceeds an alliance in its closeness and in its effectiveness. Now, most people say, well, that's really, really neat rhetoric. <laughs> Chinese don't usually do that rhetoric, but it's, it, you know, it helps, helps Putin. Well, that's what it was designed to do, okay? Now, uh, on December 15th, when... Uh, when they said this, on that very same day, uh, the, the Russians gave those draft treaties, those very far-reaching proposals, they still call them, on the security situation in Europe and how it has to change, okay? Now, I suppose it could be a coincidence that the, the Russians picked that same day, showing the closeness of their relationship with China and giving this ultimatum in some sense to, to the West and to the US, I don't think it was a coincidence. Maybe we have the next slide, please. Okay, now we fast forward to this year, February 4th, Putin is in Beijing to launch the Olympics with Z. And he says that, uh, you know, our friendship uh, well, actually, they both say in a very, very important joint declaration, not just rhetoric, guys. This is the real thing. Friendship between the two states has no limits. There are no, quote, forbidden areas of cooperation. Well, well, are we to take them at their word? Uh, when do the Winter Olympics end? When are they over? People were saying that the Russians might, might strike out against Ukraine, uh, but would pause until the Olympics were over. Uh, when did the Russians invade Ukraine? You know, after a couple of days after the end of the Olympics. May we have the next slide, please? <clears throat> okay, now the big deal here is what a surprise this was to <laughs> to all of us, right? I mean, it wasn't all of us. It was me <laughs> and lots of others. And I, 
And I next Saturday, I, I thought I'd go to confession of being so wrong. But the, the line was so long with my colleagues <laughs> that I thought I'd put it off to the next Saturday. Yeah, dead wrong on whether the, the Russians would invade Ukraine. I didn't think they needed to. I thought they could get what they wanted uh, simply by acquiescing in the notion that they couldn't get NATO to say, no more people in NATO, not, not going to happen anyway. And then going for the, what they call the, uh, the secondary issues, like the employment of cruise missiles and worse, uh, right at the eastern, at the western edge of, of Russia. But no, it ends up here uh, that, that China, China has supported uh, Putin. I, I think, you know, not only a lot of Russian experts, but a lot of Chinese experts were surprised at that. I mean, rhetoric is one thing, uh, violating your cardinal foreign policy principle of non-intervention in the affairs of other people, as, as was China's, is another thing. And it's been a whole week now. Uh, we don't know. Maybe the Chinese will change their mind, but so far. And not only China, India. Now, you know, I asked myself the question, well, what's different between the West and the U.S. and India and China? Well, I mean, one obvious difference is they were all white. And they're non-white. And that could be very mischievous because James Baldwin, way back when, suggested that it's much easier for imperialist whites to get out after blacks or browns or yellows. So does exceeds an alliance mean mutual defense pact? Well, uh, probably not. I don't think the Chinese want to be bound by what happens in Europe and I don't think the Russians want to be bound by what some crazy Chinaman might do vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. But it's a virtual alliance. And it's no small thing that uh, China is supporting, uh, supporting Putin uh, on the ground, at the UN, <clears throat> elsewhere. Um, and it's more than rhetoric. Now, when we talk about Putin's new, I called it assertiveness. And I've been saying for weeks now that China is the much neglected factor behind this. China has made Putin a big guy, like on the streets of New York. Uh, nobody's gonna push me around anymore because I got the leader of this other gang that's really, really powerful. So you're gonna push me around anymore. I think that's part, a big part of why Putin has proven not only assertive, but aggressive. And I wonder where he'll stop. I just don't know. Um, the real question here is how we can work to make sure that negotiations succeed once Putin has finished what he intends to do in Ukraine. And that's a biggie. Uh, that's really big because uh, we're, right now we're looking pretty silly by imploring the Chinese to look, do something about this fella, do something. Uh, can't you intercede? And, and we're looking a little bit strange because, as I say, not only China, but other countries, including India, have voted uh, against us. Now, do we have a, a let's see how much time we have. Yeah. For one more minute, I want to show another, another video. And I think it's important to know this because it's way back uh, a while ago, uh, I think 15, and it shows Putin uh, talking about what really, really troubles him. And it was the, the notion that uh, tomahawk, <laughs> the tomahawk, as Putin says, missiles can be emplaced in these so-called ABM sites in Poland, Romania, and maybe even Ukraine. Would it be possible to show uh, the minute and a half, the two and a half minutes of that right now? This is from an old recording. 
pay very good attention to this next clip, which just is about a minute long. And it shows Putin very uncharacteristically losing his cool. He's talking to Western journalists. They don't get it, okay? They have no idea how the Russians look at this as a threat to their national security, as a threat to the retaliatory capability if these missile defense systems are able to squelch their offensive capability with their ICBM. So watch, watch this next uh, thing and, and you'll see from this segment, which I hope will go on just a few seconds now, how Putin really is kind of beside himself because as you can see some of these Western journalists say, oh, well, that's interesting, uh, yeah. So let's have that second, uh, second clip, please. Нет, а система ПРО продолжает строиться. Значит, мы были правы, когда говорили, что нас обманывают. С нами не искренне, ссылаясь на якобы имеющуюся иранскую ядерную угрозу при строительстве системы ПРО. Ну, так оно и есть, на самом деле. В очередной раз пытались нас надуть. Сейчас построили эту систему, сейчас ставят там ракеты. Так? Но вам должно быть известно, что ракеты эти закладываются в капсулу, которая используется для пусков ракет средней дальности Томагавк морского базирования. Туда закладывают сейчас антиракеты, способные поражать цели на расстоянии 500 километров. Но мы знаем, технологии развиваются. Мы примерно знаем, в каком году примерно американцы получат новую ракету, которая будет уже не 500 километров, а 1000, а потом больше. И с этого момента они начнут угрожать нашему ядерному потенциалу. Мы, мы по годам знаем, что будет происходить. И они знают, что мы знаем. Это вам только вешают лапшу на уши, как у нас говорят. А вы, в свою очередь, вешаете своему населению. И люди не чувствуют опасности. Вот меня что беспокоит. Ну как, вот, как мы не можем понять? Мы, мы тащим мир вообще в, в совершенно новое измерение. Вот в чем проблема. Делают вид, что как будто ничего не происходит. Но я не знаю даже, как достучат. So there you have it, you know, what's the matter with you folks? Why can't you understand this? And he's talking to the journalists, of course, and you can't see any rational discussion of this in Western media. So just to finish up here, um, here's Putin way back then saying, how am I going to get through to you? And it was the same in his official conversations with U.S. statesmen, okay? And that's when he and the military in Russia built up these hypersonic missiles. And he said, uh, look, now you have to listen to me. And it's that's when he went after China to become a virtual ally. Now, um, I thought, as I wrote, that Putin making these far reaching proposals would be satisfied with half a loaf. This loaf seemed really important to him. The notion that tomahawks and worse could be stationed right, right across the border. But no, he wasn't satisfied, obviously. What he wanted to do, and this I underestimated, was to make sure that he protected Russian speaking and Russian citizens uh, in Ukraine. And he's done that and still more. So where will he stop? I think he stops when he's, when he's satisfied that there are no, no, no more Nazis or proto-Nazis or neo-Nazis in power there. That's going to take some cleansing, uh, but he's going to do it. And then I hope and I, I, I expect that the Chinese and, and the Russians get together. Okay, that's enough of that stuff. Now let's get together and make sure nothing untoward happens in the future. Uh, I'll, I'll yield the floor then. Uh, thanks for listening. And I really look forward to your questions and conversation. Hi, it's Ron Maxwell here. I followed your whole argument. But the one thing you left out is uh, the agency of the Ukrainian people. It's, it, you talk about this as, as if it's only the United States the, and Russia that has any stakes here. It seems to me the highest stakes are with the Ukrainian people. And what we've watched in the last week is that they have something to say about this, which has nothing to do with what we want or what the Russians want. It's what they want.
And it seems to me, based on what we're seeing 24-7, they will never surrender. And the Russians will be faced with a situation much worse than they faced in Afghanistan. Well, we'll see whether that happens or not. Uh, you, there's no question that the Ukrainians have agency. I, I don't dispute that. And my view all along is that if the Ukrainians were smart, what they would do is divorce themselves from the United States, right? They've hitched their wagon to the United States. And your description of how the Ukrainians are behaving today is absolutely correct. And we're encouraging that, right? And uh, as I said in my presentation, the question is, what are the consequences of that? Uh, you're quite confident that the Russians will lose in Ukraine the way they lost uh, in Afghanistan. I, I would not bet a lot of money on that, but I would note that even if the Russians lose in the process, they will destroy Ukraine. Uh, and from Ukraine's point of view, that's not a good thing. This is why my view is that Ukraine should have long ago divorced itself from the United States and worked out a modus vivendi with Russia. Uh, my view is if you're a reasonably small power in the international system and you live next door to a gorilla, you have to go to great lengths to accommodate that gorilla. And the last thing you want to do is poke that gorilla in the eye because the gorilla will do great damage to you and it probably will never forget. Uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember uh, when Fidel, Castro came to power in 1959, but shortly thereafter, we put sanctions on Fidel Castro and on Cuba. And those sanctions are basically still on Cuba. We've never gotten over the fact that Cuba behaved in ways that we considered to be unacceptable. And I think you have a similar situation here. And my view is, yes, the Ukrainians have agency, but if they were smart, they'd divorce themselves from the United States and uh, try to work out a modus vivendi with Russia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ray and John. I'm the, uh, the vice chairman of the committee hosting the question and answer session. And I have a roster of people I'd like to call on who have been participants. I'd like to make three just opening observations uh, that can be deliberated on by the participants and, and uh, John and Ray. One, it, it's not clear to me that uh, the choice is either one or the other with regard to responsibility. In the law, there's something known as comparative negligence. You can have both parties partially responsible. It's not just one or the other. It may be the case here. Uh, the second is with regard to these existential threats. Uh, I don't know whether or not there's a moral or legal right for a nation to uh, ensure it to have a right to a buffer zone. Uh, most of the nations of the world don't have a buffer zone and they have ex existential threats and they don't attack neighbors. Um, the third observation is, yes, uh, Mr. Putin speaks regularly, uh, but it's not altogether clear that he's honest. He denies trying to poison his dissidents in London or elsewhere, shooting down aircraft uh, over Ukraine or otherwise. Doesn't mean he lies all the time, but Surely we can't just take at face value what he says. But those are just open observations to throw into the mix here. And I'd like to call on Jack Matlock, if you could uh, contribute your views, Jack, uh, given your experience and background, which is uh, very, very profound and, uh, and thorough. So what's, what's your observations on the both very, very uh, masterful presentations by John and Ray? I guess what worries me now is the you might say, the state of President Putin's own mentality. I was one of those who was quite certain he would not invade Ukraine. I was also one of the people who, around 2003, said if we were in a war with Iraq in 2004, President Bush would not be reelected. So uh, I'm, I'm not a good... Um, I'm not a good prognosticator. Uh, I do think that uh, politically, a strong reaction um, was inevitable in the United States when you got the direct uh, invasion. And, um, but I worry that it has gone so far that it is becoming increasingly 
a, uh, an attack on the Russian people themselves, denigrating them. And I would say, in addition to all the things that uh, the others have talked about, I think one of the most unfortunate things that has happened has been uh, the personal demonization of uh, Vladimir Putin. And in that regard, our present president, from, well, from the time when he was uh, uh, the senior Democrat on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and voted for NATO expansion, later continued to keep Jackson Vanek in force long after Russia was no longer uh, um, subject to it. And in 2008, when he started running for president, he said he would stand up to Vladimir Putin. I really don't know what Vladimir Putin had done to him or to the United States at that point. So, you know, and then of course, uh, particularly in the second half of the Obama administration where everything is being explained as a, a reaction to Vladimir Putin, we're going to cost him for what he's doing, et cetera. I think this is very dangerous. And going back to my experience in, in the Reagan and the first Bush administrations, one of the, I would say one of the basic points in our strategy to end the Cold War was to start dealing with the Russian leaders as individuals pay attention to where they're coming from. Ronald Reagan spent more, much more time trying to understand Gorbachev and where he was coming from than he did studying, you know, throw weights and warheads and, and uh, the technical aspects of arms control. We have talked a lot about NATO expansion, but it's not just that, although, of course, assigning, um, assigning American uh, forces uh, to Ukraine, as we have been uh, doing, uh, certainly crossed a, a red line that anybody would understand. But it was much more than that. Remember that beginning with uh, George W. Bush, we began to pull out of almost every arms control agreement we had. It's, uh, we pulled out of the ABM treaty, which had been the basis of it. We pulled out of later of this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, uh, INF treaty. Mm -hmm. We pulled out of open size, which had been an American proposal ever since the Eisenhower administration. And at the same time, we were injecting ourselves directly into Russian politics, and as far as Russia was concerned, even worse in the politics, the domestic politics of the other um, of the other ex-Soviet uh, republics. So it seems to me that there was a, an absolute, um, almost effort. Uh, to, uh, to denigrate and to insult. First Putin, and then in many cases, the Russian people as a whole. I mean, I was astounded when President Obama was saying something, Russia makes nothing that anybody wants. At that time, the only way we could get to the International Space Station was with Russian rockets. And we were trying our best to keep Iran and Turkey from buying Russian anti-aircraft things. I mean, how can an educated, decent person, as I'm sure Obama is, make statements like that? Well, anyway, I think we have reached a situation which is extraordinarily dangerous. And I'm not sure we are handling it as responsibly as Kennedy and Khrushchev handled it uh, back 
uh, when I was a junior officer in the American embassy in Moscow and translated some of Khrushchev's messages to Kennedy. Thank, thank you, Jack. Could I, do we just need to have the time space here. Jack, I'm gonna move on to Ted Postal if that's all right. We'll come back if we have further time. Um, but those are very, very trenchant remarks. Uh, Ted, your observations. This is a highly political talk for obvious reasons. And uh, my only uh, small addendum, I won't take too much time on this, is something that's a very big minor, well, technical problem, which is of major importance, which is that the Russian uh, early warning system is nothing like the American early warning system. In the United States, we know when a ballistic missile has been launched from any point in the world at, at any given time. The Russians cannot do this. And because of that, uh, more than 20 years ago now, there was a false alert that occurred at a time of extreme uh, peacefulness between both countries. And, and uh, we know that the Russian military officers involved made decisions also based on their judgment that there was nothing going on between our countries. If that same accident had occurred uh, in the last few days, a different outcome might have occurred. I, I, I think people, have, I think the Russians are very careful about nuclear weapons. In fact, from my, in my judgment, they are much more so than we are, we Americans. Nevertheless, the fact that the Russian early warning system does not give them comprehensive understanding of what is going on throughout the world when missiles are launched mm. is extremely dangerous when you have a period like this. Now, to the benefit, uh, the, one of the few things I've, I, I just want to make one more comment on is that just a few hours ago, uh, there was a little news item saying that the United States has decided not to have uh, a ballistic missile test that was scheduled sometime in the next few days or hours. I think that is an extremely uh, good decision because the Russians only have a very piecemeal idea of what is happening with nuclear forces in, around the world. And anything that happens in one place cannot be confirmed by observations of other places. And because they don't have uh, what I would call global situational awareness, that could put their forces onto a higher level of alert and possibly even lead to uh, actions associated with pre-delegated authority, which we know for sure the Russians have to be doing because their warning system does not give them adequate time for the kinds of consultations that we are, uh, are plan to have if we ever need to uh, make a decision about our nuclear forces. So this is kind of a technical observation. It's peripheral to the, the main political issues that, which I basically agree with here. But I think uh, it's a real problem. Uh, I have been talking about it for well over 20 years. I get laughed at when I talk to people from the Pentagon about trying to do something constructive that would be uh, between both countries. I, I point out to them that if the Russians attack us because they think they're under attack when they are not, it's not in the interest of the United States uh, to let that uh, remain as a, as a condition. But you just have, there's no interest at all in cooperation on this matter. And in some ways, although it's politically extremely different from what we're now talking about, it is another example of how uh, there is a, a kind of underlying uh, uh, unacceptance of Russians having a legitimate set of concerns for their own security. And in that, it, and on that matter, I strongly agree with Ray. And, uh, and uh, of course, I strongly agree with uh, John Mearsheimer as well. I'll stop here. Thank you, Ted. Um, and it underscores, I think, what John said about the reason uh, why he's in a state of alarm, even though uh, the likelihood of a nuclear uh, exchange is We all should be very alarmed. We should be the nuclear very alarmed. Of all of us, yes. Um, now I'd like to go to uh, Susan Eisenhower. You know, your father's 
uh, warning about the military industrial complex has been mentioned here. Uh, but do you have any observations to, to add to the group? First of all, it's, uh, may I just say that it's a real delight to see uh, Jack Matlock and also know that there are other friends and colleagues on this uh, call. I'm here really mostly in listening mode um, because I sort of stepped away from being deeply involved in uh, this field about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. I've been working in the energy space, but uh, this crisis, I think, is deeply unsettling. Um, if anyone is interested in my views, um, I post regularly at uh, www.susaneisenhower.com, and I do have a piece on the nuclear threat uh, this week because, I mean, we're all losing sleep over it. And, and Ted Postal, thank you for reminding me. Uh, this is, I'm taking notes here, but I had forgotten about this situational awareness problem, which is really deeply disturbing. So... Uh, do I have any comments on the military industrial complex? Well, not exactly in this, but while I'm promoting myself here, uh, I wrote a book called How I Led, The Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. And I think there's a lot in that book about, um, about why he wrote that section in this farewell address and the problems he was having with his own, um, you know, his own um, military, people who uh, were his comrades during World War II over things like the missile gap and the bomber, I should say the bomber gap and the missile gap. Um, and then of course, uh, um, you know, how that played out uh, as we went into the presidential election of 1960. Uh, anyway, I think this is a persistent problem uh, that, uh, and I know many military people who recognize that it's a problem. Uh, what role they play in this particular crisis, I don't know, but I will say that I'm alarmed that we're not hearing a variety of voices in the, you know, in our news media, uh, because this is a really complex issue. And I've had people uh, ask me to be on their television programs, and I'm simply not going to do something like this in two minutes or three minutes. I mean, I, I spent 27 years of my career, um, you know, following all of these uh, events, and it's just too complex to sum it up in two words, except that we've got to be extremely careful, especially around this nuclear issue. If we can get through that, we can get through a lot. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, you. well, thank you for those observations, Susan. I think your father deserves great applause. I think he's the last president who stood up to the military and was able to call a bluff. Uh, everyone else seems to capitulate very quickly. Uh, the next uh, step. If I could just add one thing, and this is where it all gets tricky, is that he really was not a politician. And that's the point I make in my book. He was a military man who spent eight years in the White House. And after he retired, uh, he, uh, President Kennedy said, is there anything I can do for you? And he says, yes, I'd like to be called General Eisenhower from now on. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, we haven't had a bipartisan president quite like that uh, since then. So what we've got to do is on this issue is be very careful that it doesn't get politicized going into two uh, very big electoral moments uh, at the end of this year. And of course, two years after that. Yes. Well, I, my remembrance, as Susan, is that at one time uh, your father was courted by both Democrats and Republicans who wanted <laughs> them to be their presidential nominee. Uh, that's quite a phenomenon. Uh, we haven't got close to that in a long time. Well, if I could just add to that, uh, he writes in his diary after he's had uh, visits from both Democrats and Republicans, and he said, after what he heard them say, all it wants, makes him want to do is dive under his desk. <laughs> 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 oh, well, anyway, thank you for this opportunity. Nice okay. to see everybody. Wonderful. Thank you, Susan, for those remarks. Uh, Adam, do uh, you want to contribute now? Yes, thank you very okay. much. Uh, Wonderful. I suppose that my view would, I, I'm a little bit surprised that nobody seems to bring up uh, Poland under Jaroszewski and roughly 40 years ago, almost exactly 40 years ago, in fact, that and the Czech Republic, because while I entirely agree uh, with Russian grievances, etc., I also feel that uh, the right to a buffer zone is um, not, doesn't belong to a country that, that is not making itself attractive politically to the outside world. And 
this is where the Ukraine is much closer to the Czech Republic and Poland in, it, in its current identity. I mean, obviously, the Ukraine is made up of lots of uh, subcomponents that are oddly shaped and antagonistic and, and have their own peculiarities. But collectively, they, they do have the same set of aspirations as, as Poland and the Czech Republic have had over um, a protracted period of time. And uh, I don't feel that it is uh, right to expect them to uh, make themselves subservient to an operating system uh, such as Putin runs in Russia uh, if they don't want to. And clearly they don't want to be a part of that. And there's very, just very, this is probably an irrelevant and slightly too uh, peculiar a point to make, but uh, I remember vividly talking to somebody who is an American lawyer working for Deripaska. And we were saying, well, it's interesting, is Russia evolving? Is Putin trying to do anything to have the system evolve, the legal system evolve from being presidential to precedential? <laughs> and the answer was no. Uh, that was the disappointing thing. Obviously how law is practiced in the United States is very uneven too. Uh, Southern District of New York is, has a good reputation. There are plenty other parts of the country which have much less reputation and these things can be politically charged. But how well and even-handedly uh, law is practiced is, is very different even within our own country. But could one say of Russia that the system was evolving in a way that was going to protect, provide, a rule of law? And the answer was no, this really is not happening. And I, 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 I bring this up, peculiar though the point might seem, because as an example of how Russian political culture has not been evolving in a way that countries that aspire to, to something different could, uh, could want to accept. And, and that's why I feel that the evolution in the Czech Republic and in Poland, regardless of the fact that both, of, certainly Poland is much more um, going through its own difficulties, uh, nonetheless, they want to be a part of Europe and uh, whatever that means to them. And they do not really want to be a part of Russia. And at that point, as a country of 44 million, uh, they're own aspirations for self-definition need to be recognized and taken into account, regardless of how legitimate Russia's complaints about being ignored and um, having their wishes and their security concerns uh, run, be run roughshod over. Sorry, that wasn't a very good sentence, but if you want to see what I'm saying, thank you. Adam, could I just ask before I go on to Ron Maxwell, uh, me, can you compare that attitude that you've ascribed, you know, Poland or Czech Republic or Ukraine not wanting to be absorbed by a country that is completely lawless, uh, it's just whatever uh, Putin wishes, uh, to the attitude of Taiwan towards being absorbed into mainland China, which also uh, has lawlessness and everything is dictated by President Xi. Are those situations comparable or not, you think? Uh, I, I'm not in a position to judge. I know so little about Taiwan, uh, you know, aside from reading The Economist type thing. So uh, I'm really not in a position to judge, but I, I would have guessed from what little I do know that, uh, yeah, what's happened in Hong Kong is deeply, deeply worrying to Taiwan and not the least bit surprising to them. So yes, they have, they're, in, they're in a similar situation of this larger entity has a, a political and legal culture that we do not want for ourselves. I'll take the liberty now, since I'm uh, in the, the chair as a ersatz for John Henry, I wanted to raise with, uh, with uh, John Mearsheimer, you made some comparisons to 
uh, Russia's reaction, Ukraine and uh, the U.S. and Cuba, Fidel Castro, um, and uh, how we uh, viewed uh, Cuba and Castro as a threat to our, our security interest, an existential threat. And the response, you know, we had the Bay of Pigs, the attempted assassinations of Castro that have out Operation Mongoose. Uh, we even had plans after the failed um, Bay of Pigs to invade. Um, uh, do you think those um, responses of the United States were uh, morally or legally um, legitimate um, responses uh, that uh, that we made? You know that were an example that uh, other countries should and can follow, or are they something that ought not to be followed? This is a great question, and of course, it follows on one of your three initial points, as well as Adam Dixon's comments, which have to do with the subject of rights and, and what's morally or legally uh, permissible in the international system. I think that in an international politics, states usually pay attention to international law and they pay attention to moral precepts as long as they're in their strategic interests. But if there's a conflict between international law and a country's strategic interests, the country will always privilege its strategic interests and international law and human rights will be pushed off the table. This is why I think it's not very helpful to talk about rights. Uh, when you talk about whether Russia has the right to have a buffer state or Ukraine has the right to have its own foreign policy. These are concepts that, in my opinion, get you into all sorts of trouble. In the international system, might makes right. And the United States would never tolerate a situation where Canada or Mexico invited, in a legal way, China to bring military forces into Toronto or Mexico City. We have a Monroe Doctrine, which is in our strategic interest. And our Monroe Doctrine says, no distant great power is allowed to put military forces in the Western Hemisphere, period, end of story. What the Russians are doing here is they're basically articulating their own version of the Monroe Doctrine. They're saying you cannot turn Ukraine into a Western bastion on our border. It has nothing to do with rights, right? It doesn't matter whether Ukraine has the right to do this or that. We're saying they can't do it. Just like we're saying Cuba can't inv invite the Soviets to bring military forces into the Western Hemisphere. So for me, when you talk about great power politics, rights in the final analysis just don't matter. Might makes right. And the United States is a mighty powerful country. It's a mighty powerful country on purpose. And it does whatever it thinks is in its strategic interest. And if the rights say that's OK to do, good. But if the rights are at odds with what's in our strategic interest, we do what's in our strategic interest. Well, let me, let me offer this, uh, John. Uh, the Declaration of Independence. Um, now, may we departed from it, but it certainly spoke in terms of rights. You know, men and women, they're, they're born with unalienable rights. And they also articulates a right and a duty to rise up and throw off a tyrannical government. Now, maybe the Declaration of Independence is quaint, but actually it's what gave birth to this nation you know, that we're residing in right now. Uh, it may well be that as a descriptive matter, uh, we're still living with uh, Thucydides, the strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. Uh, and it may well be that, uh, as a practical matter, maybe things don't change, but I don't think we should necessarily view as irrelevant, as you're saying, assigning responsibility. Maybe there's in peri delicto. Uh, and responsibility means making a moral judgment, even if the moral judgment has no immediate practical significance. Don't you think the Declaration of Independence is worth uh, admiring and aspiring towards? I think the Declaration of Independence is of enormous importance. I thank my lucky stars I was born in a liberal democracy, right? And I, I think, like you, regret the fact that liberal democracy is at 
is under threat at home. But my view, and I'm probably different than you, Bruce, in this regard, is that international politics is a different domain than domestic politics. And in international politics, the Thucydides uh, way of thinking about the world where might makes right is what applies. I'm not in favor of going around and beating up on other states, and I'm not in favor of wanton violence and so forth and so on. And I do think that what is happening in Ukraine is absolutely horrible. It makes me sick to my stomach. But on the other hand, I think it's very important to understand basic realist logic. And the reason it's important to understand realist logic is because at least in this case, that's what informs Putin. Putin is thinking like Thucydides, and Americans have a terribly difficult time putting themselves in Putin's shoes. And this is because Americans tend to think in terms of rights and in terms of American exceptionalism and all these other ideas that I think get us into trouble. I think, you know, going back to the film clip that Ray put up there where Putin uh, talked about in that New York Times op-ed, the trouble America causes by thinking of itself as an exceptional nation is correct. I just don't want to think that way in IR, and I don't want to think about rights when it comes to international relations. Ray, did you want to add your thoughts? Uh, I just wanted to add, Bruce, uh, that uh, John Mearsheimer needs no endorsement from me, uh, but I would simply add that this is, I think, we talk about uh, offensive realism or offensive, uh, it's offensive to, to think that uh, uh, one should have to deal not so much with rights, but with might uh, when one is judging international relations problems. Um, but realism uh, really needs to be uh, the primary factor here, particularly when, as John pointed out at the beginning of his remarks, it matters, it matters greatly as to how we got here and who bears the primary responsibility. I, I agree. And sometimes I say my, my view is that you can have more than one actor be responsible. They say in the law, it's called comparative negligence, the same idea here. Um, and, I, to, to my, and my view is that there isn't any right to buffer state. Why do just big powers get to say, you know, we get to declare we have an existential threat and attack you. Most of the countries in the world have existential threats. We could blow up all of them tomorrow, you know, uh, with the snap of a finger. Yeah, we don't say, OK, well, then they could attack the United States. Anyway, that's for another session here. Does anybody else want to uh, offer? I don't want to cut anybody off. Have any uh, additional questions before we uh, we close the session? The speakers have been marvelous. Every participant, I think, has been wonderful here. I want to congratulate everybody. Uh, but is there any last questions that would like to be asked? Yeah, actually, I, I would like to ask a question. And basically, uh, there are two variables that I'd like to, to uh, first of all, I thought that the talk was, was fantastic. But there are two things that I, I wanted to ask about. One was the economic aspects of this, and the other is the political will of the people in Ukraine. So when we talk about might is right, the question I have is, uh, Russia is Russia's might is being undermined by the sanctions. And so Putin is now uh, potentially facing uh, a decrease in his war fighting capabilities because of the economic situation. He's also going to lose the support of, he may lose the support of the oligarchs and the population at large. And then uh, on the Ukrainian side, you have this will to fight and you've got the potential for a guerrilla war, it seems to me, over long term, uh, if not uh, success uh, in a conventional fashion. So I, I just was curious to get your thoughts about the economic aspects of the situation, plus you know, the, the issue of the political will on the part of the Ukrainians to determine their own destiny, which may include a guerrilla war. Okay, I, if I, I just... could get in another, uh, Dr. Mearsheimer, if I could just get another question to piggyback on that. Sure. Uh, I've really been waiting to get this in as well. I think it uh, matches very well with the economic aspects. Um, first of all, thank you for doing this. Uh, unfortunately, in the policy community, as you know today, there really are no voices at all for your point of view. Everything that we're seeing is more sanctions, uh, more punishment. And the question is, 
if Putin runs into the problems that he may run into in case this insurgency doesn't go his way, his regime will be undermined. If the sanctions are biting enough to have an effect, they're going to collapse and implode Russia's economy, which would undermine his regime. If he goes back with nothing to show for his misadventure, that will undermine his regime. And my question is, uh, what will his reaction be then? I'm not asking you to prognosticate, but from uh, the standpoint of what you've seen over the last 20 years, is he someone to back down or are we going to see a ratcheting up uh, from his point of view? Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you for the uh, why don't we just to organize it, John? Why don't you respond first, and then Ray, you chip in, and then we're going to call it to a close. Yeah, Th those are two great questions, and uh, I, I think that the question that it is really on the table here is whether or not, with sanctions and the costs of war, just the cost of losing people and fighting in Ukraine, that coupled with economic sanctions can uh, inflict enough punishment on the Russian people and the oligarchs that they rise up against Putin, right? Th this, is, this is the question. And I think there are two reasons that's not going to happen. I I'm not saying I'm right, you're wrong, but I, I think that what the scenario that you two described will not prove to be correct. And let me tell you why. The first is nationalism. States are able to sustain huge amounts of punishment and the population does not rise up against the ruler. You wanna think about what we did to Japan in World War II. You wanna think about what we did to Germany. You want to think about the literature on sanctions, economic sanctions. Look at Iran. It's amazing what we've done to Iran. Look at Cuba. There have been sanctions on Cuba forever, right? And these countries don't throw up their hands. So the first point I would make to you is nationalism is a very powerful force. And I think that the Russian people will rally around Putin. Second point I would make to you is, as a result of this, uh, uh, this talk that I gave that's ricocheting all over the internet, plus the New Yorker piece, I get, I get like a thousand emails every day. I can't even open up all the emails I get. But I've gotten a number of emails from Russians. These are educated people uh, who are not hostile to me in any way. And I read those emails to say that you want to understand that you Americans are threatening Mother Russia. And what's going on here is not simply a case of Putin misbehaving and us liking the Americans. And what's going to happen here is we're going to overthrow Putin. The emails I'm getting, and this is not a scientific sample, but it is consistent with my general point about nationalism is that the more we push against the Russians in Ukraine and the more we threaten the regime, the more that people will rally around Putin. Now, again, I could be proved wrong on that, but my bet is that he'll be able to withstand the sanctions. And by the way, this gets to Ray's point. Ray's point is the Chinese are going to help him. We know the Indians are going to help him. We've heard that the Mexicans are going to help him. So it's not clear that we'll be able to punish him that much over the long term. But then again, even if we do punish him, do you think that's going to bring the Russian people to their knees or Putin to his knees? I wouldn't bet a lot of money on that. Ray, you've got closing Thanks. argument. Well, I would like to identify myself with what John just said. Uh, but let's posit, in other words, I think the Russians will get through this. I think there are a lot of reasons that they will. Um, let's posit that Putin does have his back up against the wall. I think it was Jack Matlock, my friend Jack, who suggested he's not quite sure of Putin's relative stability now. It's a legitimate question. I was surprised as hell 
that he invaded Ukraine, even with Chinese support, even under threat of all kinds of other things, sanctions. But he did. And so, and he sounds a little bit more emotional than I've ever heard, heard him sound before. So will it be a good thing if Putin's back is up against the wall? I don't think so. And this is why. <clears throat> He gratuitously, for the first time in my experience, and that goes back about 60 years, <clears throat> raised the, nu the nuclear possibility. <clears throat> that is big, okay? That means that he would consider implying that if he really had his back against the wall. Now, what does he look at? What does he see when he looks at uh, the United States? He sees what Ted Postal has just explained to us. He sees that he doesn't have global dominance, so the, the global awareness to find out what's being shot at him and when. He also sees people like Admiral Thomas Richards, head of SAC, now called Stratfor, who says, you know, we might, we might have to, yeah, we might have to use nuclear weapons. He says, he sees people like, uh, what's his name? That little guy, uh, Stavridis. Yeah, he says, Stavridis, another admiral. Yeah, we're going to be in a nuclear war with, with China in, in 10 years. That's what Putin sees. And so the, the reason this thing is so labile, as the Germans would put it, so tentative and so dangerous, is because these people need to keep their mouths shut. And he, what, what Putin would like is to Biden shut these guys up and say, look, no one wins in a nuclear war. I signed that thing with, with Putin. He agrees. So we're not even going to talk about that. And yet here we have Putin talking about it. So it's a matter of Putin's stability and what having his back up against the wall. I don't think it's going to happen because of the sanctions. What that would mean, that would not be good news in my view. Well, thank you so much, uh, John, Ray, audience. You've all been wonderful. Sorry I have to do a close, but uh, we'll see you on the next uh, Zoom meeting. But uh, you both have set a standard to which the wise and honest may repair. And we thank you for that. All right. Okay. Bye. Everybody. Bravo.
Hi, it's Ron Maxwell here. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you, but I thought we're going to go to Ray next to talk oh, and, and then go to questions. I, well, somebody, you know. I, I have to leave in about 30 minutes, but if the, one question, I, I followed your whole argument. But the one thing you left out is uh, the agency of the Ukrainian people. It's, it, you talk about this as, as if it's only the United States and, the, and Russia that has any stakes here. It seems to me the highest stakes are with the Ukrainian people. And what we've watched in the last week is that they have something to say about this, which has nothing to do with what we want or what the Russians want. It's what they want. And it seems to me, based on what we're seeing 24-7, they will never surrender. And the Russians will be faced with a situation much worse than they faced in Afghanistan. Well, we'll see whether that happens or not. Uh, there's no question that the Ukrainians have agency. I, I don't dispute that. And my view all along is that if the Ukrainians were smart, what they would do is divorce themselves from the United States, right? They've hitched their wagon to the United States. And your description of how the Ukrainians are behaving today is absolutely correct. And we're encouraging that, right? And uh, as I said in my presentation, the question is, what are the consequences of that? Uh, you're quite confident that the Russians will lose in Ukraine the way they lost uh, in Afghanistan. I, I would not bet a lot of money on that, but I would note that even if the Russians lose in the process, they will destroy Ukraine. Uh, and from Ukraine's point of view, that's not a good thing. This is why my view is that Ukraine should have long ago divorced itself from the United States and worked out a modus vivendi with Russia. Uh, my view is if you're a reasonably small power in the international system and you live next door to a gorilla, you have to go to great lengths to accommodate that gorilla. And the last thing you want to do is poke that gorilla in the eye because the gorilla will do great damage to you and it probably will never forget. Uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember uh, when Fidel Castro came to power in 1959, but shortly thereafter, we put sanctions on Fidel Castro and on Cuba. And those sanctions are basically still on Cuba. We've never gotten over the fact that Cuba behaved in ways that we considered to be unacceptable. And I think you have a similar situation here. And my view is, yes, the Ukrainians have agency, but if they were smart, they'd divorce themselves from the United States and uh, try to work out a modus vivendi with Russia.